Melanta Tata by Edgar Allan Poe. To the editors of the ladies' book, I have the honor of sending you for your magazine an article which I hope you will be able to comprehend rather more distinctly than I do myself. It is a translation by my friend Martin van Buren Mavis, sometimes called the Poughkeepsie Seer, of an odd looking manuscript which I found about a year ago tightly corked up in a jug floating in the Mare Tenebrarum, a sea well described by the Nubian geographer, but seldom visited nowadays, except for the transcendentalists and diverse for crotchets. Truly yours, Edgar A. Poe. On board balloon, Skylark, April 1st, 2848. Now, my dear friend, now for your sins, you are to suffer the infliction of a long gossiping letter i tell you distinctly that i am going to punish you for all your impertinence by being as tedious as discursive as incoherent and unsatisfactory as possible besides here i am cooped up in a dirty balloon with some one or two hundred of the canal all bound on a pleasure excursion what a funny idea some people have of pleasure and i have no prospect of touching terra firma for a month at least nobody to talk to nothing to do when one has nothing to do then is the time to correspond with one's friends you perceive then why it is that i write you this letter it is on account of my ennui and your sins get ready your spectacles and make up your mind to be annoyed i mean to write at you every day during this odious voyage Hi ho when will any invention visit the human pericranium are we forever to be doomed to the thousand inconveniences of the balloon? Will nobody contrive a more expeditious mode of progress? The jog-trot movement, to my thinking, is little less than positive torture. Upon my word, we have not made more than a hundred miles the hour since leaving home. The very birds beat us, at least some of them. I assure you that I do not exaggerate at all. Our motion, no doubt, seems slower than it actually is this on account of our having no objects about us by which to estimate our velocity and on account of our going with the wind to be sure whenever we meet a balloon we have a chance of perceiving our rate and then i admit things do not appear so very bad accustomed as i am to this mode of travelling i cannot get over a kind of giddiness whenever a balloon passes us in a current directly overhead it always seems to me like an immense bird of prey about to pounce upon us and carry us off in its claws one went over us this morning about sunrise and so nearly overhead that its drag rope actually brushed the network suspending our car and caused us very serious apprehension our captain said that if the material of the bag had been the trunkery varnished silk of five hundred or a thousand years ago we should inevitably have been damaged this silk as he explained it to me was a fabric composed of the entrails of a species of earthworm the worm was carefully fed on mulberries kind of fruit resembling a watermelon and when sufficiently fat was crushed in a mill the paste thus arising was called papyrus in its primary state and went through a variety of processes until it finally became silk singular to relate it was once much admired as an article of female dress balloons were also very generally constructed from it a better kind of material it appears was subsequently found in the down surrounding the sea vessels of a plant vulgarly called euphorbium and at that time botanically termed milkweed this latter kind of silk was designated as silk buckingham on account of its superior durability and was usually prepared for use by being varnished with a solution of gum calchon a substance which in some respects must have resembled the gutta percha now in common use the calchon was occasionally called indian rubber or rubber of twist and was no doubt one of the numerous fungi never tell me again that i am not at heart an antiquarian talking of drag ropes our own it seems 
as this moment knocked a man overboard from one of the small magnetic propellers that swarm in ocean below us a boat of about six thousand tons and from all accounts shamefully crowded these diminutive barks should be prohibited from carrying more than a definite number of passengers the man of course was not permitted to get on board again and was soon out of sight he and his life preserver i rejoice my dear friend that we live in an age so enlightened that no such a thing as an individual is supposed to exist it is the mass for which the true humanity cares by the by talking of humanity do you know that our immortal wiggins is not so original in his views of the social condition and so forth as his contemporaries are inclined to suppose pundit assures me that the same ideas were put nearly in the same way about a thousand years ago by an irish philosopher called furrier on account of his keeping a retail shop for cat peltries and other furs pundit knows you know there can be no mistake about it how very wonderfully do we see verified every day the profound observation of the hindu aries total as quoted by pundit thus must we say that not once or twice or a few times but with almost infinite repetitions the same opinions come round in a circle among men april second spoke to-day the magnetic cutter in charge of the middle section of floating telegraph wires i learned that when this species of telegraph was first put into operation by horse it was considered quite impossible to convey the wires over sea but now we are at a loss to comprehend where the difficulty lay so wags the world tempora mutantur excuse me for quoting the etruscan what would we do without the atlantic telegraph pundit says atlantic was the ancient adjective we lay to a few minutes to ask the cutter some questions and learn among other glorious news that civil war is raging in africa while the plague is doing its good work beautifully both in europe and asia is it not truly remarkable that before the magnificent light shed upon philosophy by humanity the world was accustomed to regard war and pestilence as calamities do you know that prayers were actually offered up in the ancient temples to the end that these evils might not be visited upon mankind is it not really difficult to comprehend upon what principle of interest our forefathers acted were they so blind as not to perceive that the destruction of a myriad of individuals is only so much positive advantage to the mass april three it is really a very fine amusement to ascend the rope ladder leading to the summit of the balloon bag and then survey the surrounding world from the car below you know the prospect is not so comprehensive you can see little vertically but seated here where i write this in the luxuriously cushioned open piazza of the summit one can see everything that is going on in all directions just now there is quite a crowd of balloons in sight and they present a very animated appearance while the air is resonant with the hum of so many millions of human voices i have heard it asserted that when yellow or hunted will have it violet who is supposed to have been the first aeronaut maintained the practicability of traversing the atmosphere in all directions by merely ascending or descending until a favorable current was attained he was scarcely hearkened to at all by his contemporaries who looked upon him as merely an ingenious sort of madman because the philosophers of the day declared the thing impossible really now it does seem to me quite unaccountable how anything so obviously feasible could have escaped the sagacity of the ancient savants but in all ages the great obstacles to advancement in art have been opposed by the so-called men of science to be sure our men of science are not quite so bigoted as those of old oh i have something so clear to tell you on this topic do you know that it is not more than a thousand years ago 
since the metaphysicians consented to relieve the people of the singular fancy that there existed but two possible roads for the attainment of truth believe it if you can it appears that long long ago in the night of time there lived a turkish philosopher or hindu possibly called aries tottle this person introduced or at all events propagated what was termed the deductive or a priori mode of investigation he started with what he maintained to be axioms or self-evident truths and thence proceeded logically to results his greatest disciples were one Euclid and one Kant. well aries tottle flourished supreme until advent of one hog surnamed the ettrick shepherd who preached an entirely different system which he called the the a posteriori or inductive his plan referred altogether to sensation he proceeded by observing analyzing and classifying facts instantanea naturae as they were affectively called into general laws aristotle's mode in a word was based on nomina hogs on phenomena well so great was the admiration excited by this latter system that at its first introduction aries tottle fell into disrepute but finally he recovered ground and was permitted to divide the realm of truth with his more modern rival the savans now maintain the aristotelian and baconian roads were the sole possible avenues to knowledge baconian you must know was an adjective invented as equivalent to hogian and more euphonious and dignified now my dear friend i do assure you most positively that i represent this matter fairly on the soundest authority and you can easily understand how a notion so absurd on its very face must have operated to retard the progress of all true knowledge which makes its advances almost invariably by intuitive bounds the ancient idea confined investigations to crawling and for hundreds of years so great was the infatuation about hog especially that a virtual end was put to all thinking properly so called no man dared utter a truth to which he felt himself indebted to his soul alone it mattered not whether the truth was even demonstrably a truth for the bullet-headed savans of the time regarded only the road by which he had attained it they would not even look at the end let us see the means they cried the means if upon investigation of the means it was found to come under neither the category aries that is to say ram nor under the category hog why then the savants went no farther but pronounced the theorist a fool and would have nothing to do with him or his truth now it cannot be maintained even that by the crawling system the greatest amount of truth would be attained in any long series of ages for the repression of imagination was an evil not to be compensated for by any superior certainty in the ancient modes of investigation the error of these germans these french these english and these americans the latter by the way were our own immediate progenitors was an error quite analogous with that of the wiseacre who fancies that he must necessarily see an object the better the more closely he holds it to his eyes these people blinded themselves by details when they proceeded hoggishly their facts were by no means always facts a matter of little consequence had it not been for assuming that they were facts and must be facts because they appeared to be such when they proceeded on the path of the ram their course was scarcely as straight as a ram's horn for they never had an axiom which was an axiom at all they must have been very blind not to see this even in their own day for even in their own day many of the long-established axioms had been rejected for example ex nihilo nihil fit a body cannot act where it is not there cannot exist antipodes darkness cannot come out of light all these 
and a dozen other similar propositions formally admitted without hesitation as axioms were even at the period of which i speak seemed to be untenable how absurd in these people then to persist in putting faith in axioms as immutable bases of truth but even out of the mouths of their soundest reasoners it is easy to demonstrate the futility the impalpability of their axioms in general who was the soundest of their logicians let me see i will go and ask pundit and be back in a minute here we have it here is a book written nearly a thousand years ago and lately translated from the english which by the way appears to have been the rudiment of the american pundit says it is decidedly the cleverest ancient work on its topic logic the author who was much thought of in his day was one miller or mill and we find it recorded of him as a point of some importance that he had a mill horse called bentham but let us glance at the treatise ah ability or inability to conceive says mr mill very properly is in no case to be received as a criterion of axiomatic truth what modern in his senses would ever think of disputing this truism the only wonder with us must be how it happened that mr mill conceived it necessary even to hint at anything so obvious so far good but let us turn over another paper what have we here contradictories cannot both be true that is cannot coexist in nature here mr mill means for example that a tree must be either a tree or not a tree that it cannot be at the same time a tree and not a tree very well but i ask him why his reply is this and never pretends to be anything else than this because it is impossible to conceive that contradictories can both be true but this is no answer at all by his own showing for has he not just admitted as a truism that ability or inability to conceive is in no case to be received as a criterion of axiomatic truth now i do not complain of these ancients so much because their logic is by their own showing utterly baseless worthless and fantastic altogether as because of their pompous and imbecile proscription of all other roads of truth of all other means for its attainment than the two preposterous paths the one of creeping and the one of crawling to which they have dared to confine the soul that loves nothing so well as to soar by the by my dear friend do you not think it would have puzzled these ancient dogmaticians to have determined by which of their two roads it was that the most important and most sublime of all their truths was in effect attained i mean the truth of gravitation newton owed it to kepler kepler admitted that his three laws were guessed at these three laws of all laws which led the great english mathematician to his principle the basis of all physical principle to go behind which we must enter the kingdom of metaphysics kepler guessed that is to say imagined he was essentially a theorist that word now of so much sanctity formerly an epithet of contempt would it not have puzzled these old moles too to have explained by which of the two roads a cryptographist unriddles a cryptograph of more than usual secrecy or by which of the two roads champollion directed mankind to those enduring and almost innumerable truths which resulted from his deciphering the hieroglyphics one word more on this topic and i will be done boring you is it not passing strange that with their internal prattling about roads to truth these bigoted people missed what we now so clearly perceive to be the great highway that of consistency does it not seem singular how they should have failed to deduce from the works of god the vital fact that a perfect consistency must be an absolute truth how plain has been our progress since the late announcement of this proposition investigation has been taken out of the hands of the ground moles and given 
as a task to the true and only true thinkers the men of ardent imagination these latter theorize can you not fancy the shout of scorn with which my words would be received by our progenitors were it possible for them to be now looking over my shoulder these men i say theorize and their theories are simply corrected reduced systematized cleared little by little of their dross of inconsistency until finally a perfect consistency stands apparent which even the most stolid admit because it is a consistency to be an absolute and an unquestionable truth april four the new gas is doing wonders in conjunction with the new improvement with gutta percha a very safe commodious manageable and in every respect convenient are our modern balloons here is an immense one approaching us at the rate of at least a hundred and fifty miles an hour it seems to be crowded with people perhaps there are three or four hundred passengers and yet it soars to an elevation of nearly a mile looking down upon poor us with sovereign contempt still a hundred or even two hundred miles an hour is slow travelling after all do you remember our flight on the railroad across the canada continent fully three hundred miles the hour that was travelling nothing to be seen though nothing to be done but flirt feast and dance in the magnificent saloons do you remember what an odd sensation was experienced when by chance we caught a glimpse of external objects while the cars were in full flight everything seemed unique in one mass for my part i cannot say but that i preferred the travelling by the slow train of a hundred miles the hour here we were permitted to have glass windows even to have them open and something like a distinct view of the country was attainable pundit says that the route for the great canada railroad must have been in some measure marked out about nine hundred years ago in fact he goes so far as to assert that actual traces of a road are still discernible traces referable to a period quite as remote as that mentioned the track it appears was double only ours you know has twelve paths and three or four new ones are in preparation the ancient rails were very slight and placed so close together as to be according to modern notions quite frivolous if not dangerous in the extreme the present width of track fifty feet is considered indeed scarcely secure enough for my part i make no doubt that a track of some sort must have existed in very remote times as pundit asserts for nothing can be clearer to my mind than that at some period not less than seven centuries ago certainly the northern and southern canada continents were united the canadians then would have been driven by necessity to a great railroad across the continent april fifth i am almost devoured by ennui pundit is the only conversable person on board and he poor soul can speak of nothing but antiquities he has been occupied all the day in the attempt to convince me that the ancient americans governed themselves did ever anybody hear of such an absurdity that they existed in a sort of every man for himself confederacy after the fashion of the prairie dogs that we read of in fable he says that they started with the queerest idea conceivable viz that all men are born free and equal that this in the very teeth of the laws of gradation so visibly impressed upon all things both in the moral and physical universe every man voted as they called it that is to say meddled with public affairs until at length it was discovered that what is everybody's business is nobody's and that the republic so the absurd thing was called was without a government at all it is related however that the first circumstance which disturbed very particularly the self-complacency of the philosophers who constructed this republic was the startling discovery that universal suffrage gave opportunity for fraudulent schemes by means of which any desired number of votes might at any time 
be pulled without the possibility of prevention or even detection by any party which should be merely villainous enough not to be ashamed of the fraud a little reflection upon this discovery sufficed to render evident the consequences which were that rascality must predominate in a word that a republican government could never be anything but a rascally one while the philosophers however were busied in blushing at their stupidity in not having foreseen these inevitable evils and intent upon the invention of new theories the matter was put to an abrupt issue by a fellow of the name of mob who took everything into his own hands and set up a despotism in comparison with which those of the fabulous zeros and hello fagabaluses were respectable and delectable this mob a foreigner by the by is said to have been the most odious of all men that ever encumbered the earth he was a giant in stature insolent rapacious filthy had the gall of a bullock with the heart of a hyena and the brains of a peacock he died at length by dint of his own energies which exhausted him nevertheless he had his uses as everything has however vile and taught mankind a lesson which to this day it is in no danger of forgetting never to run directly contrary to the natural analogies as for republicanism no analogy could be found for it upon the face of the earth unless we accept the case of the prairie dogs an exception which seems to demonstrate if anything that democracy is a very admirable form of government for dogs april six last night had a fine view of alpha lyrae whose disc through our captain's spyglass subtends an angle of half a degree looking very much as our sun does to the naked eye on a misty day alpha lyrae although so very much larger than our sun by the by resembles him closely as regards its spots its atmosphere and in many other particulars it is only within the last century pundit tells me that the binary relation existing between these two orbs began even to be suspected the evident motion of our system in the heavens was strange to say referred to an orbit about a prodigious star in the centre of the galaxy about this star or at all events about a centre of gravity common to all the globes of the milky way and supposed to be near alcyon in the pleiades every one of these globes was declared to be revolving our own performing the circuit in a period of a hundred and seventeen million of years we with our present lights our vast telescopic improvements and so forth of course find it difficult to comprehend the ground of an idea such as this its first propagator was one modler he was led we must presume to this wild hypothesis by mere analogy in the first instance but this being the case he should have at least adhered to analogy in its development a great central orb was in fact suggested so far mother was consistent the central orb however dynamically should have been greater than all the surrounding orbs taken together the question might then have been asked why do we not see it we especially who occupy the mid-region of the cluster the very locality near which at least must be situated this inconceivable central sun the astronomer perhaps at this point took refuge in the suggestion of non-luminosity and here analogy was suddenly let fall but even admitting the central orb non-luminous how did he manage to explain its failure to be rendered visible by the incalculable host of glorious suns glaring in all directions about it no doubt what he finally maintained was merely a centre of gravity common to all the revolving orbs but here again analogy must have been let fall our system revolves it is true about a common centre of gravity but it does this in connection with and in consequence of a material sun whose mass more than counterbalances the rest of the system the mathematical circle is a curve composed of an infinity of straight lines but this idea of the circle this idea of it which 
in regard to all earthly geometry we consider as merely the mathematical in contradistinction from the practical idea is in sober fact the practical conception which alone we have any right to entertain in respect to those titanic circles with which we have to deal at least in fancy when we suppose our system with its fellows revolving about a point in the centre of the galaxy let the most vigorous of human imaginations but attempt to take a single step toward the comprehension of a circuit so unutterable i would scarcely be paradoxical to say that a flash of lightning itself travelling for ever upon the circumference of this inconceivable circle would still for ever be travelling in a straight line that the path of our sun along such a circumference that the direction of our system in such an orbit would to any human perception deviate in the slightest degree from a straight line even in a million of years is a proposition not to be entertained and yet these ancient astronomers were absolutely cajoled it appeared into believing that a decisive curvature had become apparent during the brief period of their astronomical history during the mere point during the utter nothingness of two or three thousand years how incomprehensible that considerations such as this did not at once indicate to them the true state of affairs that of the binary revolution of our sun and alpha lyrae around a common centre of gravity april seventh continued last night our astronomical amusements had a fine view of the fine neptunian asteroids and watched with much interest the putting up of a huge impost on a couple of the lentils in the new temple of daphnis in the moon it was amusing to think that creatures so diminutive as the lunarians and bearing so little resemblance to humanity yet evinced a mechanical ingenuity so much superior to our own one finds it difficult too to conceive the vast masses which these people handle so easily to be as light as our own reason tells us they actually are april eight eureka pundit is in his glory a balloon from canada spoke us to-day and threw on board several late papers they contain some exceedingly curious information relative to canadian or rather american antiquities you know i presume that laborers have for some months been employed in preparing the ground for a new fountain at paradise the emperor's principal pleasure garden paradise it appears has been literally speaking an island time out of mind that is to say its northern boundary was always as far back as any record extends a rivulet or rather a very narrow arm of the sea this arm was gradually widened until it attained its present breadth a mile the whole length of the island is nine miles the breadth varies materially the entire area so pundit says was about eight hundred years ago densely packed with houses some of them twenty stories high land for some most unaccountable reason being considered as especially precious just in this vicinity the disastrous earthquake however of the year twenty fifty so totally uprooted and overwhelmed the town for it was almost too large to be called a village that the most indefatigable of our antiquarians have never yet been able to obtain from the site any sufficient data in the shape of coins medals or inscriptions wherewith to build up even the ghost of a theory concerning the manners customs etc 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 of the aboriginal inhabitants nearly all that we have hitherto known of them that they were a portion of the knickerbocker tribe of savages infesting the continent at its first discovery by recorder Riker, a knight of the golden fleece they were by no means uncivilized however but cultivated various arts and even sciences after a fashion of their own it is related of them that they were acute in many respects but were oddly afflicted with monomania for building what in the ancient american was denominated churches a kind of pagoda instituted for the worship of two idols 
that went by the names of wealth and fashion in the end it is said the island became nine-tenths of it church the women too it appears were oddly deformed by a natural protuberance of the region just below the small of the back although most unaccountably this deformity was looked upon altogether in the light of a beauty one or two pictures of these singular women have in fact been miraculously preserved they look very odd very like something between a turkey cock and a dromedary well these few details are nearly all that have descended to us respecting the ancient knickerbockers it seems however that while digging in the centre of the emperor's garden which you know covers the whole island some of the workmen unearthed a cubicle in evidently chiselled block of granite weighing several hundred pounds it was in good preservation having received apparently little injury from the convulsion which entombed it on one of its surfaces was a marble slab with only think of it an inscription a legible inscription pundit is in ecstasies upon detaching the slab a cavity appeared containing a leaden box filled with various coins a long scroll of names several documents which appear to resemble newspapers with other matters of intense interest to the antiquarian there can be no doubt that all these are genuine american relics belonging to the tribe called knickerbocker the papers thrown on board our balloon are filled with facsimiles of the coins manuscripts typography etc etc i copy for your amusement the knickerbocker inscription on the marble slab this cornerstone of a monument to the memory of george washington was laid with appropriate ceremonies on the nineteenth day of october eighteen forty seven the anniversary of the surrender of lord cornwallis to general washington at yorktown a d seventeen eighty one under the auspices of the washington monument association of the city of new york this as i give it is a verbatim translation done by pundit himself so there can be no mistake about it from the few words thus preserved we glean several important items of knowledge not the least interesting of which is the fact that a thousand years ago actual monuments had fallen into disuse as was all very proper the people contenting themselves as we do now with a mere indication of the design to erect a monument at some future time a cornerstone being cautiously laid by itself solitary and alone excuse me for quoting the great american poet Benton. as a guarantee of the magnanimous intention we ascertain too very distinctly from this admirable inscription the how as well as the where and the what of the great surrender in question as to the where it was yorktown wherever that was and as to the what it was general cornwallis no doubt some wealthy dealer in corn he was surrendered the inscription commemorates the surrender of what why of lord cornwallis the only question is what could the savages wish him surrendered for but when we remember that these savages were undoubtedly cannibals we are led to the conclusion that they intended him for sausage as to the how of his surrender no language can be more explicit lord cornwallis was surrendered for sausage under the auspices of the washington monument association no doubt a charitable institution for the depositing of corner stones but heaven bless me what is the matter ah i see the balloon has collapsed and we shall have a tumble into the sea i have therefore only time enough to add that from a hasty inspection of the facsimiles of newspapers etc etc i find that the great men in those days among the americans were one john a smith and one zachary a tailor good-bye until i see you again whether you ever get this letter or not is point of little importance as i write altogether for my own amusement i shall cork the manuscript up in a bottle however and throw it into the sea 
yours everlastingly pandita end of melantotata by edgar allan poe